Want to use a PGR in wheat, durum, oats, or barley, but don't have time for a separate pass? With Manipulator PGR, you can spray from one tiller up to early flag leaf, so add it to the tank with your herbicide and save the extra time. Manipulator PGR shortens the crop and strengthens stems to reduce lodging risk, increase harvest efficiency, and maximize yields. Ask your local crop protection retail to make a plan today. I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome, everybody, to Real Ag on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. It is great to chat with everybody here on 650 CQM and 980 CJME. Hope you had yourself a great week. We've got a great show for you here today, and uh, we're going to be talking to Peter Wee, Pete Johnson. So Pete regularly joins me on Mondays on the Real Ag Radio Show for Agronomic Monday. He's going to sneak in. We're going to talk about a few specific agronomic uh, items when it comes to Saskatchewan. We're also going to hear from Dr. Brian Bears. He's with AFC. Lethbridge. We're going to talk about some of the a study where he looked at the yield gaps between where yields are now in Western Canada versus the potential and compared that to some other geographies in North America. Some interesting findings there that Brian's going to talk about. And we've got some beef, we've got a beef market update as well with Saskatchewan's own and Wasco at the Gateway Livestock Exchange. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email shaney at realagriculture.com or of course you can find us across all the different social media platforms or you can uh, call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. Joining me now, uh, as I mentioned, is Peter Wheat Pete Johnson. Hey, Pete, how's it going? Yeah, going awesome, thanks, Sean. Just uh, lots of stuff happening. We're into spring. It always it always lifts my spirits when I start to see equipment in the field and, and the sun shines. Not that it's shining particularly today, but but nonetheless, it's, a, it's the right time of year for Wheat Pete. Yeah, you and I are at our, our Real Ag Summit, so we are in, we're actually in Toronto, so broadcasting this weekend show in Saskatchewan from Toronto, so, uh, and uh, it's been great to be able to spend a couple days with you and talk about everything that's going on in, in agriculture, and uh, we're kind of at that point, Pete, where people are trying to figure out, okay, weather's getting warmer, we can put the winter jackets away. Go or no go. A lot of times we'll talk. This is a phrase that it's used lots in the corn belt, you know, waiting for that soil to be fit. But it also applies if you're seeding spring wheat and pulses and canola as well. Yeah, 100%. But being fit and and time of year and when it's time to go and when it's not. Certainly, if I'm talking about uh, canola right now, even if it was fit, it's too early to seed canola. On the other hand, with, with spring wheat or barley or oats, if it's fit, just give it, baby. Get it in the ground. And so Robin tweeted out uh, a, a, her soil probe in the soil, and it was minus 3 Celsius. And so it's kind of like, okay, we got to wait for a while yet. Our Ontario data would say if if you could punch the soil into that and not do damage, mm-hmm. that that actually is okay. But Brian Barris's work out of out of uh, AAFC Lethbridge pretty clear that man once it's over zero Celsius, Brian would say go certainly at two degrees Celsius on above zero, you you give it. And so with the spring cereals, you better be ready to go now because it doesn't take long for the soil to go from minus three to plus two. Mm -hmm. And in most of Western Canada, it probably isn't overly wet. So as soon as it gets there, you you hit the field. Uh, Because our our sort of old strategy was wait till 10 degrees, Uh, eight degrees. Yeah. So actually, everybody's everybody's. I don't know, mantra was a little different from that perspective. Uh, Some people would have said, wait till five degrees. Some people would have said, wait till eight or 10. Wheat, barley, and oats, they're all base zero crops, which means they grow any time it's above zero degrees Celsius. Eh, That's maybe a little bit of a stretch. Wheat might be a plus two Celsius crop. But why would you wait? Because even, 
even on the days where it goes to minus four at night and plus 10 during the day, there's a time that that soil is above plus two and, and the wheat is growing during that time frame. And it's pretty clear in the data, in Brian's data, in our data, we never once lost yield from ultra early seeding. Once in a while, you might actually, if it stays wet and miserable and cold for like five weeks after you seed it, the seed can rot in the ground. So, so it can happen. Okay. But then you reseed, and all you're out is the, is the pass over the field and the seed because there would have been no opportunity in that five-week window to seed anyway. Meanwhile, if you only get two weeks or three weeks of, of that wet backward weather, your, your crop's in the ground and it's growing when it can, and the other crop isn't yet started, so that head start that you get makes such a difference. It, it makes bet for better weed control, better crop competition, uh, oftentimes heavier test weights. There's some growers in, West, in oh, Western yeah, Canada yeah. have been doing this, and, and uh, uh, they had, I think last year, 68 pound per bushel test weight and 16.3% protein. And you just go, man, if, if that isn't quality wheat, boy, I don't know what is. What about frost, though? Yeah, so frost doesn't, and that's why you can't do canola, right? Uh, that's Be, right, yeah. Because yeah. with canola, the growing point, as soon as it germinates, comes above the ground. And so we get the, the minus four, the minus six, the canola's dead. With the spring cereals, growing point stays below the soil surface until it hits, you know, at least the four, five leaf stage, mostly the five leaf stage. So as long as it's below the soil surface, takes a lot of cold weather to get cold enough at an inch deep in the soil to kill that plant. It's not impossible, but it's pretty doggone rare. Yeah, and we've also seen a lot of growers, too, because of flea beetles. And, and, and even if you get a light touch of frost, it holds that canola plant back, right? It's, it struggles to get going, right? And so the longer it's stalled out growing, the more of a window you're giving those flea beetles at that growth stage to attack and eat and eat and eat. And, and so people have pushed back their canola seeding. That emergence happens later when it's a little bit warmer. You grow through that flea beetle period, and that's a win. At least that's what the strategy people have been talking about. Yeah, 100%. And it makes perfect sense. As much as from a, from a purely yield standpoint, if there wasn't flea beetle, right. you would seed earlier because you would get higher yields. But yeah. even, even without the frost... Just the cooler temperatures in that early seeding window means the canola right. grows slower. So even if it's not stressed by frost, it can't outgrow the flea beetle damage. If you delay that seeding, get it to pop out of the ground fast and grow really quickly, then it can outgrow the, the flea beetle damage much more easily. And, and you can get a, a crop where other times you might get decimated. And, and launching that crop out of the ground... At the same time, like I've seen a lot of the data on corn, I'm making the assumption though, because a lot of this crosses crops, it's the same for spring wheat, pulses, canola, as even as that emergence happens, the better it is for you from a yield standpoint long term. Yeah, and so you're right, Sean, but it's be way, careful. Be careful. Okay. It's way more critical in the corn crop than it is in something like canola or soybeans because canola and soybeans, you know how canola branches. You, yeah. get, you get one plant per square foot and it's, it's all you ever need. It, it compensates. Right, yeah. exactly. Whereas if you think about corn, corn doesn't compensate in the same way. Wheat tillers, so it's not, it's still the best crop emerges uniformly. I don't care what, what species we're talking about, but at the end of the day, Corn is the most critical, and if your canola isn't all as uniform, it's, it's still going to do fairly well if you can beat the, the flea beetle. Okay, Pete, you're going to stick with me here because I, 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 <clears throat> I've got some questions regarding, we, we've talked about getting the seed in the ground, we've talked about emergence. Next, we're going to talk about early weed control and the importance of that. You're listening to Real Ag on the Weekend, and of course, we are here on 650 CQM and 980 CGME.
If you're involved in the agriculture industry, it's important to stay informed on all the latest issues affecting your business. At realagriculture.com, we offer fast, reliable news, information, and insights to help you keep on top of all of the latest in Canadian agriculture. Visit realagriculture.com and sign up for our free daily newsletter covering everything from news, agronomy, animal agriculture, and much more. Visit realagriculture.com forward slash subscribe today. There's a reason we call it the Corn School. Videos on everything from planter setup to weed control, field trial results, and the latest yield strategies. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com. From realagriculture.com or as a podcast in your favorite podcast app, check out the latest Corn School episode today. The deadline to sign up for AgriStability is April 30th. Thanks to recent program changes, AgriStability coverage levels have improved significantly for 2024. To gain a better understanding of how AgriStability and other programs can improve your farm's risk management plan, visit mnp.ca. And welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. Here, of course, on 650 CKOM 980 CJME. Your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. Hey, I want to remind you, on Monday nights, Real Ag in primetime, 8 o'clock Eastern, Eastern, six o'clock Mountain. We'll do. We'll help you guys out. Seven o'clock in Saskatchewan. We do the Agronomist, hosted by Lindsay Smith of RealAgriculture.com, and it's a hour-long show dedicated to agronomy, a topic, and then we have an expert come in from different geographies. This week, we're, they're talking about on-farm trials. Of course, you can watch it by going to RealAgriculture.com/live or at the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. I'm joined by Peter Wheat, Pete Johnson. Okay, Pete, we've talked about getting the seed in the ground. We've talked uh, about emergence. And now let's chat about early weed control, an, inc- an absolute critical component when it comes to determining yield. Yeah, 100%, Sean. And, and can I just, before I start weed control, can yeah. I do a shout out for the agronomists? Because, man, you get two agronomists on there and, and you get such a level of information around around the topic. And I, I'm an on field trial person right or in field like i yeah. love field trials and so some of the data like a lot of people talk about yield monitors and how yield monitors are the be all and end all they aren't mm. and i think really important on monday night to Why not? listen oh, because if you're going uphill it's a it's not a way a, a load cell it's a pressure sensor and so when the grain hits that pressure sensor, if you're going uphill, it hits at a different angle than if you're going downhill. And if it's a waxy kernel, or uh, th- then it slides better. If it's a wet kernel, it doesn't slide as well. All of those things impact just how accurate that yield monitor is. And they're great, but you, you have to understand how to use them well to get good data. And, and that's, I think, one of the focuses that, that we want to make sure people are aware of w- I, on Monday night. That, that's a really cool part of it. Okay, that, that's a great tip. Not what I thought you were going to say. So what did you think I was going to say? Leave a check strip. Well, okay. So if you don't have a check strip, you have no point of reference. You're not even doing a trial. You're right, exactly. And if it's one quarter section to another quarter section, that is not a trial. You you do the middle half of that section and the or quarter section and the middle half of that quarter section. And now I have four replications, and now I have a trial. But yeah, uh, yeah there's lots of things around that to talk about. But yield monitors and and this this concept of putting blocks in a field and whatnot. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that you got to be really careful i love trials but you've got to make sure it's good data yeah you know what great point it's not the fact of just doing the trial it, you got to have the right methodology and you don't listen you're not you we're hearing from brian bears from afc lethbridge here a little bit you're not running like a scientific you're not writing a paper on it but you, you got to have the roots of some good methodology so that it's actually information that you can use because if it's crap in it's crap out a hundred percent and you don't want to be making decisions on poor information right exactly so that's it, costing your bottom line a hundred percent so yep that on-farm trials can can give great information if they're done correctly and you know how to interpret the data, and that's what it's all about. And, and some of the technology we have now makes them 
uh, I guess, easier in, in a sense or more um, possible, maybe. I, I think there were, I just know growing up on the farm, a lot of times, best of intentions. You get the trial seeded, maybe you get it sprayed. If somebody didn't screw up that, you know, maybe that, 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 that opportunity for that mess up, if it's different herbicide packages, like on canola. But then you get to harvest, and that's where I think a lot of on-farm trials fail because you gotta you got to have the actual <laughs> info like on the yield side of it, right? Yeah. And that's where you're like, you know what? Screw the trial. <laughs> we got to get harvest done. And, and you kind of did all that work and you kind of messed it up at the end. But yeah. I think some of the technology now helps with that. A hundred percent. The yield monitor helps with that yeah. as long as you know how to in- interpret it well. Fair enough. Okay. Early weed control. Yeah. Early weed control. Incredibly critical. It's really interesting in, uh, in most crops that that early weed interference is where you get the biggest yield impact. And so if the weed emerges with the crop... It has far more yield impact than as if the weed emerges after the crop. Interesting. And so there's some great data where, where you know, a, a water hemp, for example, if water hemp emerges with the crop, 300,000 seeds that that one water hemp plant mm. will, will produce. If it, if it emerges after the crop, 30 days later, and that's quite a period, but it just gives you the example, not 300,000 seeds, 3,000 seeds. That's a big difference. 1%. <clears throat> Would that be the same as kosher? 100%. Not, not, yeah. not the same amount of seeds, but no, just no, but, relatively but it, speaking. Uh, relatively speaking, uh, in the game, I, I don't have the data, so it might yeah. be somewhat different, but, but it will still be a massive difference. It's all about crop competition. So getting control on the weeds early, it, really critical, and... If you get a few late weeds, they just don't have the same impact. Yeah, because there was sort of a, a cost-saving strategy out there one time oh. where, and we saw this a lot on herbicide-tolerant canola, where, ah, yeah, two passes. You're just trying to get me to spend money. I'm going to wait for the whole flush to come, and then I'm going to spray in one pass, and I've saved myself money. But there is so much data out there now to show that is costing yourself tons of yield. Spray early, baby. Yeah, and so it's not only yield. Big weeds are harder to kill. And so if you miss the weed or you select for resistance because you're only using one product late, oh, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's so many components to that. No, uh, spray early, and if you have to, spray often. But if you spray early, you often don't have to spray often. That's fair enough. Right? Like, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm a I'm a zero tolerance weed control guy, so I don't like you, to see. You're, you're like see, you see a weed, you shoot, you kill. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. Yeah. Um, on, we got about a few minutes left here, Pete. On uh, Monday, Real Ag Radio. I encourage everybody to go listen to Agronomic Monday. We talked about sprayer. Well, while we're talking about spraying, yeah. sprayer compaction. Yeah. And wheel wheel uh, thickness or uh, width width. Right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, makes a big difference when it comes to compaction, along with PSI. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, a couple things about sprayers, because not everybody even pays attention to this. But the balance of the of the weight on the sprayer is really critical. If uh, particularly the narrower the tires, and you don't want to tramp crop. So we're often spraying with very narrow tires, with great big tanks, all sorts of weight. And we know to reduce compaction, we, we reduce pressure in the tire. But with skinny tires on a sprayer, it's almost impossible. So now, the, one of the things you have to pay attention to is the weight on the front axle versus the weight on the back axle. Oh. Because when you fold that boom out in a full tank, it changes like the boom's a lever. And so now it's putting way more weight on the back axle. So pay attention to your manufacturers. Some manufacturers have gotten really good when the booms folded out. They're balanced front to back axle. Other manufacturers haven't, haven't taken that into account yet. And so if it's all about axle weight and I've got 50% more weight on the back axle than the front axle, I'm going to create a lot more compaction than as if I can keep that unit balanced. So there's a whole bunch there. And PSI makes a difference. PSI makes a difference in the surface soil compaction. Axle weight makes the difference in deep compaction. And deep mm. compaction is way tougher to ameliorate, to fix, okay. than shallow compaction. Uh, and a fatter tire destroys more crop, but is also less compaction than a narrower tire. Exactly. So controlled traffic makes sense, uh, and, and then you just got to 
figure it out from there. Okay, well, hey, you know, if you like some of the things that Pete had to say here, great insight. Of course, you can hear him on the Real Ag Radio podcast every Monday, or what you could do is download We Pete's Word, where Pete answers all of your agronomic questions. Tons of listeners from across Saskatchewan. Pete, thanks for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Oh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And go Saskatchewan, go! Yeah, d- let's have a better summer. Let- let's have a better spring 24 than the Riders did last season, Saskatchewan, <laughs> okay? Okay, we'll be right back with more here on Real Ag on the weekend. Of course, you're listening to 650 CKOM, 980 CJME. Get all the information you need to keep your pulse crop healthy and profitable with the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. The Pulse School is a free YouTube video series covering agronomy, research, and more across a host of different pulse crops. It's also available as an audio podcast wherever you download or stream your favorite podcast. Check us out on YouTube or visit realagriculture.com, The Pulse School, brought to you by BSF Canada. The Canola School on realagriculture.com is your one-stop shop for everything a canola grower needs. Check out our free video series on YouTube for all the latest in canola agronomy, research, marketing, and more. Don't have time to watch? Download the podcast version of the Canola School on realagriculture.com or anywhere you download your podcasts. Stay on top of all things canola with the Canola School on realagriculture.com brought to you by BASF and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, The Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with The Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. And welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. We're now going to hear from Dr. Brian Bears of AFC Lethbridge. Hey, Brian, great to chat with you. Happy to be here, sir. Okay, so you did some really interesting research. We were part of a project looking at the the yield potential of wheat versus where we're you know what we're actually achieving, and looking at that yield gap in Western Canada. What did you find? Um. Well. I think just to just to back up a little bit and say, you know, why do we care? Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons. I think, um, you know, no one in Canada or the U.S. really had done this with wheat before at a at a large landscape, and so really, you know, there was there was some interest in in you know, new players trying to get into that wheat space of innovation. And and so the question started to be like, okay, so what is our, what is our state right now in terms of wheat yield? How much does it vary? And how close to the potential are we reaching it on the farm? And so what we did or what I did is I proposed that we would link up with a group called, um, the Yield Gap Atlas that's um, partly based out of um, University of Nebraska at Lincoln under Dr. Patricio Grassini, who I knew. And so we teamed up there and also with Kansas State, uh, Dr. Romil Lolato, where he would lead the U.S. And so what we wanted to do was like understand based on soil characteristics of the prairies, based on weather patterns, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and genetics, what's our potential? And then using experimental data that myself and others have, have done over the years, you know, under real control, but still fielded environment conditions, what is, what have we been realizing there in terms of potential? How does that compare? And then the third component would be, let's let's talk to producers, access different data points, or in databases to see what we're seeing on the farm. And then that difference between, you know, so you've got three bars on a graph, if you will. One is like the full on potential for the prairies. Then you have what we 
from our experimental data have given you as as sort of like the potential. And so you can push that potential, let's say, you know, 80, 85 percent of of that theoretical bar, because if you go any further than that, you're probably going to be in a cost prohibitive situation on the farm. Yep. And then that third bar would be okay. How close to that? How close to that are we getting on the farm? And that difference is our is our yield gap. And so, um, and so, yeah, it, 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 you know, a lot of work went into like, you know, gathering up and trying to understand how many unique sort of zones that do we have, what are called buffers across the prairies. That are that are wheat producing, obviously, and um, and then start modeling what the potentials are, start using our experimental data, and then start getting a sense from farmers what they're what they're actually realizing on farm. And then from that, the last phase was let's talk to and survey farmers and see what they're doing in terms of practicing to see if we can drill into you know what. What are those factors that are causing a farm to have a fairly wide gap, or what are the factors that are closing it down? And so, so that's where it came from. And then, it, you know, eventually it becomes part of this interactive map on the Yield Gap Atlas, www.yieldgap.org uh, forward slash Canada. And you can go take a look and see what you have in, in, in different areas of the prairies. So in terms of that yield gap that you just talked about, what did it work out to be for the Western Canadian prairies? Well, we're doing, we're doing actually better than the U S um, you know, and, and I think like, if I think our theoretical or that, that top end, that ceiling based on um, soil parameters, radiation, um, all that kind of fun stuff along with genetics, like we're, I believe we're in the range of topping out at around what would it be like six tons per hectare for a you know for a ceiling, and then the range that we're seeing you know on farm is is I think in the neighborhood of three point two to six. So we're you know we've got some areas where we've got a fifty percent yield gap, but for the most part. We're averaging around sixty-three to sixty-five percent of where we want to be, um, you know, and so we're not too far away from that eighty percent. Um, whereas a, a lot, surprisingly, a lot of the pl- great or the plains areas of the U.S. were closer to that fifty percent. And and the way to think about it too is like, okay, now we have this. So what what do we do with that part of it? And I think. It's important to understand, like, if you're at 80, 85, like, there's not much more on the management side to really take it any higher anyway. So that's where we would really key in on, okay, what are traits in genetics or something that's going to pull the ceiling higher? Mm. But if you're at, if you're at 50%, like, there's no point talking about moving the bar over here, the ceiling. Like we got to figure out the management that's going to take us up into that, you know, 75, 80, 85 range. And then, then at that point, we can think a little bit more about moving the ceiling further. And so I think that to me, that helps the entire value chain really understand where those priorities are or should be dedicated to. And so that was kind of the, the motivation behind it is understanding it. And then trying to sort out well, where would the priorities be um, based on that. So, and so that's where the survey piece comes in. Like, yeah. And surprisingly, um, so Aiden Sandin worked for Richard Gray up to the University of Saskatchewan. And he, um, um, he did some great work for his master's thesis. And really, in a nutshell, um, there was kind of a... Uh, an interesting thing that he came out with, like you think, you think in in media, you know, popularizing media and whatnot, you think like you hear a lot about nitrogen, right? And you would come to the conclusion probably we're probably overusing nitrogen. Well, we aren't in wheat. Um, in fact, 
what Aiden found and then what we backed up in our own survey is that we're probably under fertilizing in some areas, a lot of areas. Um, there was sort of a cutoff point of about 80, you know, 80 pounds where guys that were under 80 pounds were, were creating a yield gap. Guys that were over that were probably closing it down. And, and if, you know, I found that really illuminating myself. I was like, you know, that's, you know, that, that, you know, and then when you think about it, yeah, okay, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So that's just, you know, the one, one example of, of factors that, that start influencing where, or where and what we see for yield gaps. That is Brian Bears with AFC Lethbridge. Highly encourage you to check out. That was that's going to be in a, re, a, a wheat school that's coming out. The wheat school, of course, is brought to you by Syngenta Canada, C and M Seeds, and Alberta Grains. Go to wheatschool.com. We got a tremendous amount of wheat agronomic content on the wheat school, so please check it out at theweedschool.com or on the Real Agriculture YouTube channel. Okay, when we come back here on Real Ag on the weekend, we're going to hear from Ann Wasco, the Gateway Livestock Exchange. We're talking cattle markets right after this. I'm Lindsay Smith from realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights for The Agronomist, a one-hour live and interactive show broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and X. Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host expert agronomists from all over the country to give you answers to some of the toughest agronomic questions. Join us live or catch the replay Tuesday morning. That's The Agronomist with me, Lindsay Smith, Monday nights live at 8 p.m. Eastern. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin, host of the Soybean School on realagriculture.com. Throughout the year, on the Soybean School, we'll bring you timely agronomic video content from planting to harvest, from the latest agronomic research to the latest in production technology. Check out our massive video library on YouTube, realagriculture.com, or download the audio podcast versions wherever you get your podcasts. The Soybean School is brought to you by BASF and Syngenta Canada. And welcome back to Real Ag on the weekend. We're now going to talk about the cattle markets with Saskatchewan's own Ann Wasco, the Gateway Livestock Exchange. And, and, you know, a lot is happening right now in the cattle markets. We're not exactly on an upward trajectory every day. It has really bounced around there. This is a moment of, of volatility, so to speak. And depending on what's happening in the news, it's definitely having an impact on these cattle markets. Well, you're right. Lots of influencing, especially coming from uh, from outside noise, and and especially uh, continuing to see daily news in terms of the the uh, avian influenza or now the bovine influenza, as you've talked about already. So, but it, bottom line is the cash market in the U.S. this week's going to end about two bucks lower in the south, so that's going to be one eighty two. In the north, we end up trading at one eighty five, which is also a couple bucks lower. The dressed market in the north, two ninety three to two ninety five delivered, and that's two to four dollars lower than last week. So, you know, unfortunately, after making that high a few weeks ago of one eighty nine, the market has certainly been, you know, pretty uh, pretty much uh, down each week since then. Um, really starting with the news back uh, at the end of March on uh, the avian influenza. So that's disappointing. Um, but we talked about two weeks ago about, you know, timing is not good to recover at this point in time. And that's exactly how things are playing out. Now, the choice cut out last night, we did see it gain a buck, but I don't think we've got to read too much into it. So it closed at 289.35. We did have smaller kills this past week. Uh, Ramadan and there's some cooler uh, cleanouts being done. So with a smaller kill, smaller production, that often supports the cutout. And I think that's really all that happened there. The one comment I did want to make was on the select. You know, I talk about the choice cutout. There's also a select cutout. And it's only trading $3 back of the choice right now. Hmm. And I think one of the reasons for that narrow spread is there's some pretty big demand for our lean trim market right now, the 90 trim, as we call it, or the hamburger beef market. And uh, what's happening now with the shorter supply of that type of product with our smaller cow kills in both countries We've got um, some of those end cuts getting ground up. 
and so uh, putting putting some good strength or good demand on uh, on those on those end meets and that'll get ground and blended in with some to make those 90s so the smaller cow kill is certainly you know that's less hamburger beef and uh, strong trim prices and that even feeds right back to the Alberta cow market I know we're talking about a U.S. select um, choice product but the Alberta cow market last week 172 was the average the Canfax reported that's another all-time record high for, wow. for slaughter cows. So it's just crazy what prices have been doing to to respond to it. And what's happening right now with the basis then for for uh, some of these markets? Yeah, so there one of the things that so I've talked about the U.S. market's been lower the last few weeks. The Alberta fat cattle market has not. And it, what's been going on, Sean? Of course, earlier this year we talked about. The a very weak basis. There was times we were trading Alberta fat cattle twenty five to twenty eight dollars back of the U.S. market. Well, Alberta cattle prices were slowly getting more current, and we've got the market was up again this week. So Canfax reported four twelve to four fifteen dress. That's delivered dress. When they do come out with their live average later today, I think it's going to be up in the upper two forties. Um, so again, a nice jump on that market. And we've been we've been watching this go on for the last few weeks. So, for example, say three weeks ago, we were at a minus or back in February, we were at a minus 28 um, this week to the April board with this cash market today. We're going to be plus three. Oh, so what really? a big switch from well under to now over the U.S. market. So and we've had a weaker Canadian dollar. You know, we cracked under 73 today. So, you know, that's also been supportive to this this relationship. And then on basis, just to maybe finish that story off, the same um, kind of trend going on uh, for feeder cattle in, in Western Canada. We continue to see them narrow the gap to U.S. feeder cattle as well. So um, in February, Alberta feeders were 27 under the nearby board, and last week they were only seven under. So, And that's wow. more in line with that, with that three-year average. So both, both markets, fats, and feeders have been – catching up we were well back with the u.s market when we started this year off and and speaking of you know comparing canada to the u.s we're, we're also set in fat cattle south yeah and and there therein also is a factor in how we're how do you improve basis when you've got a very front end loaded supply like we did when we started off january in alberta lots of fat cattle available so we've seen more not just slaughtered here in canada but now seeing more move to the u.s as well and it started off, we talked about this data when it came out a, a while ago, J Sean, was January exports for fats were up 8%. February, we just got that data last week, was up 51%. And the preliminary March data, um, which we won't get from StatsCan for a bit, but just looking at the weekly data, it's going to be another big number. So we're going to have a Q1 was a, a, a quarter of really cleaning up and getting cattle moved to all different directions, not just within Canada, but also to the U.S. And that's helped to narrow this basis up yeah. as well. That's why Canada may be tackling that product of USA labeling and not having segregation at the plants. Boy, that, that's why they're arguing against that label uh, because of you know the demand for Canadian fat kettle uh, going to some of those U.S. Especially products. at times like this. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so then uh, feeder cattle coming from the U.S. into Canada, I would imagine that has not slowed down. No, and we got same thing when we got the export data, we got the feeder import data. So feeder imports in February were uh, just over 26,000 head came north. Um, and even when you net out, yeah, there was a few feeder cattle went south as well. But even when you net those out, Sean, we were a net importer of feeder cattle for the month of February to the tune of 19,000 head. So it's wow. still a big number. And um, so, you know, that continues to just... Uh, uh, reinforce this two-way trade of live cattle and beef it's it's a it's across the board man it just shows you how important it is just it reinforces it north american integrated market just keep yes. on uh keep on saying it uh, now preview expectations for the alberta cattle on feed report what's what's that yeah. going to say quickly before we wrap up yeah so canfax will release their report this afternoon that's for alberta and saskatchewan and my expectations are that, uh, like it was for the 1st of uh, March, so this will be April 1, that it should be down, um, you know, maybe 2 or 3% from a year ago. Next Friday, the U.S. will release their April 1 on-feed report, and already guesstimates are coming out that they're still going to be 2% above a year ago. So finally starting to see maybe numbers in, in Western Canada 
come down, especially these feedlot inventories. And once we do break under a year ago levels, I think we'll stay there for the rest of the year. The feeder supply is going to be that just that tight. Yeah. And it, it, you know what? Um, to wrap here, uh, weather has got a lot better. And anybody that's calving in this kind of weather right now is uh, feels like they're a little bit, they're, they're thankful. Uh, comparison to the last few years, this has been a great calving season so far. So knock on wood, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's been a great, a great season. I, I was tr- struggling with my words there, trying to find how I actually should, subs- uh, how I should uh, describe it. I, I think I hit the nail on the head. Okay. And thanks so much for joining us for this week's Beef Market Update. All the best to you. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Ag on the Weekend. I encourage you to go to realagriculture.com and check out all of the great coverage that we have of the industry of agriculture. Our YouTube channel is also there as well. And uh, check out the Real Ag podcast. We've got a really a great selection of podcasts for you to choose from that you can listen to, of course, while you're uh, driving up and down those fields through the growing season. Okay, if you have any feedback, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Would love to hear from you. This is all we have for Real Ag on the Weekend. You've been listening to 650 CKOM and 980 CJME. I'm Sean Haney. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have yourself a great day.